This is a brief review of the semester. It is not meant to be uh, precise in every detail. It is a review. Uh, it is not point by point material for the entire semester. And in addition, it is an optional study tool. Uh, no one is so obligated to view it, and it contains no new material, only material previously viewed in lecture. For that reason, if you do not get to view this video, it does not detract from your studies for the final examination. In our first lecture of the semester, we talked about what, what we were doing. Uh, we were, you know, our objective is pr principally to uh, study the electromagnetic interaction. And that's at its most basic level. Um, an interaction between electrons and protons. Uh, in our following lectures, we talked about the need to study trig and to use trig, and so we did some trig review, as I'm sure many of you will remember. Uh, before we started electromagnetism, however, we had to do a little bit of study of fluids. Uh, and so here's an example of a part of a lecture that we studied buoyancy on, on a swimmer. Another factor of fluids uh, that we studied was uh, the Bernoulli effect and the, the behavior of fluids that are in motion, um, in which, and, and this was one of the uh, slides that we studied uh, in detail, very carefully made. When we started the um, theory of electromagnetism, we looked at the Coulomb interaction the electrostatic force between two positive or between two charged particles, whether they're positive or negative. In this case, they both have the same sign because the forces are in opposition. They're going in opposite directions. One of the abstractions that we made from that study, and we did all kinds of force, force calculations and so forth, a lot of trig, uh, was that the electric field is a suitable and helpful abstraction uh, of the, uh, the physically measurable Coulomb interaction. And the electric field, in this case, the electric field of a point charge Q1, um, ends up being a very, very helpful abstraction and in fact, we have studied electric field effects all the way through the semester. Here's a very, very uh, frequently used uh, structure, the parallel plates capacitor. All right. And one of the things that we found was that the electric field is constant in this region and so forth, similar to the, elect the gravitational field approximately constant on the surface of the Earth. We did a lot of physics with this. And one of the things that we developed from that uh, is the idea of voltage, the electrostatic potential, uh, which is similar to, but not exactly the same thing as the electrical potential energy. They're related, but they're not the same. The electric field is the negative of the uh, gradient delta V over delta X uh, of the potential. So it has the effect that protons roll down the, in, in this potential here, this V of X, electrons would roll down the hill to the left, electrons would ro roll up the hill to the right because electrons are negative. Uh, it is all related to the idea of work and force. Uh, so the potential V and the electric field E are related in this manner. One of the, and of course, in the middle there is the uh, gravitational analogy uh, to the electric field. Um, one of the useful concepts to study potential is the equipotential surface. And here's the, here are electric field lines for a dipole. So it's a dipole field. And uh, the field lines are kind of curvy. And then 
in green around them in not they're not circular but they they look circular a little bit uh, are the equipotential surfaces where the voltage is the same and we mentioned that the equipotential surfaces are similar to uh, at least in this kind of a diagram they're similar to uh, the topographic lines or the altitude lines uh, on a topographic map all right now here's our parallel plate capacitor and it's got some equipotential surfaces marked in it 100 volts on the high side zero volts on the low side and then three uh, fairly equally spaced um, equipotential lines 75 50 and 25 volts and in the middle where the field is uniform it looks like a grid you know the uh, the field lines are a uniform density so the field is constant and the uh, the equipotential lines are therefore uh, evenly spaced right the, the potential the gradient is is a constant with the capacitor, you know, basically scoped out like this, we began to look at circuits. And we looked at different kinds of combinations of capacitors, uh, parallel, which are not in this diagram, and series, which are in this diagram. And we developed the various rules for uh, combining capacitors and to envision them as one um, replacement or equivalent capacitance. Um, and in this case, we're, we're replacing C1, C2, and all the way down to Cn with a big CEQ. All right. Another thing that we started to develop were circuit laws, the most famous of which is Ohm's law, V equals IR. And um, there's a picture of George Ohm, and there's the various uh, charge concepts that we used uh, on that day. One of the physical things that we mentioned is that in a, a regular physical metal wire here on the surface of the earth in conventional devices, it's the electrons that are moving. And so, uh, but all the physics was done before anybody knew anything about uh, electrons or protons. So the, the, you know, so back in the days of Coulomb and those guys, uh, we thought of current as a, uh, you know, as positive charge moving, and that's what we call the, the, the um, conventional current. We still use that for our calculations, but then if we actually want to know what the electrons are doing, we figure out what the conventional current is doing, and then, and then realize or think about what the electron is doing, which is opposite, and that's in this diagram. We began to put uh, devices, symbolically resistors, uh, into our circuits, devices that dissipate energy. So the potential uh, drops from one end, you know, it's, it's not, it depends on where the batteries are and everything, which direction the, con the conventional current's going, but the potential will drop from one end of a resistor to another. You have to figure out which end. And uh, we figured out rules for combining uh, a series of capacitors on top there and a, a parallel uh, set of capacitors in the second image. And one of the things that we started working on were um, capacitor and resistor networks. And here's a brain burner. Um, I think this actually might have been from one of our exams. Um, and so you you know you have to think okay uh, replace R4 and R5 with an equivalent capacitance and then you've got a set of four parallel excuse me replace R4 and R5 with an equ equivalent resistance and then you've got a set of four parallel uh, resistors and then replace that and you know figure out what the total resistance is similar with um, uh, capacitors. So we were doing capacitors and resistors at first, and the capacitance 
a system with a resistance in it is going to have um, the currents as they load and as they dissipate are going to have an exponential time dependence, the RC circuit. Um, then we started talking about um, not just uh, networks, but entire circuits. You know, this one back here is not really a circuit. It's just kind of a part of a circuit. You know, the plus and the minus at the top and the bottom indicate a lot more of the circuit, which we didn't study. But we, we started using Kirchhoff's rule, the junction rule and the loop rule um, uh, to, uh, to figure out exactly what direction and how much current was flowing. That's basically what we tried to figure out with these uh, Kirchhoff's rules. All right. Now, as I mentioned, we, we started talking about, you know, how does, a, how does the current change as the capacitor is loading from the battery when you flip that switch to, you know, you, you dip it down into and complete the circuit. And we found out that that's an exponential time circuit or exponential time dependence, right? And it's used in timing. Uh, devices all over the world. After that, we were ready to start talking about magnetism. So we went to the basic um, source of magnetism, which is basically electric charges in motion. Uh, it's interesting that the thing that distinguishes an electric field from a magnetic field is that the charges are in motion. Uh, for the magnetic to, to generate a magnetic field, and this is one of the diagrams that we looked at in chapter. It's not from chapter 22, but that's that quote is from chapter 22. Um, we we then started talking about all right, how do uh, magnetic fields interact? For instance, the magnetic field of these two parallel wires. The currents are par the, the wires are parallel and the currents are also parallel. So you might have another set of parallel wires in which the, the currents are anti-parallel. But in this case, um, they're both parallel, parallel and so the, the magnetic fields attract, the magnetic interaction is attracted. And in all these magnetic field applications, don't forget the right-hand rule. Right, we had a lot of right-hand rule questions on one of our midterms. Um, we talked about the uh, the application of the right-hand rule and magnetic fields in the in in many contexts. One of them being the calutron, uh, which was used in in the, the famous Oak Ridge. Uh, I think it's the Y12 plant for separating uranium. Uh, 235, and then later, I think they use it for plutonium as well. And that question, there was a question about this very thing on one of our midterms. Although now, you know, I, I, I'm not going to be able to use any of those midterm questions as I wanted to, so you'll just have to see what's on the final. Uh, here's another diagram uh, in which we looked at the uh, magnetic forces uh, on uh, a loop of wire. This is a side view of the loop, um, and it causes torque, and, and that's the basis for generators to work. Uh, and we, we talked a little bit about uh, how generators work, and basically the person that figured out all this stuff was Michael Faraday. And we talked about his, his famous experiment with two um, uh, loops of wire, basically, one connected to a bat to a source of ch current, the battery, and the other one connected to a galvanometer, you know, basically a, a fluke, a, an electric meter to measure current. And he found that when you, when you uh, connected the battery to the upper loop, um, you forced field lines into that lower loop, and that induced a current. Now the formulas are up there in the upper right, and that minus sign is 
important because that's the Lenz's law uh, part of it. The Lenz's law means that when you gain field lines of a certain kind, the, the induced current in the loop or the series of loops is um, oriented so that it opposes the change in the, uh, the, the, basically the magnetic flux delta phi. So as delta phi changes over time, you know, for instance, it increases, the induced current will try to do a counter flux uh, with its induced current. And that's the, that's the nature of the minus sign uh, in Lenz's law. Another thing that we talked about was, um, you know, inductance between two uh, conducting systems. Um, and that's called uh, either induct self-inductance or if it's, you know, if it's a coil with itself or uh, mutual inductance. And we had various formulas for those. And we talked about how uh, the... Uh, magnetic field of the earth and the solar wind can interact and cause gigantic flows of current in the ground uh, in the solid surface of the earth and in fact igneous rock like they found find up in quebec in the canadian shield what they call the canadian shield uh west of uh, hudson bay or, or no east of hudson bay and west west of the atlantic coast that's the canadian shield they call it. it's big one of the oldest slabs of, of igneous rock on the earth and uh, perfectly designed for getting uh, ground induced current from big moder big modulations in the uh, magnetic field of the, uh, of the earth due to solar wind hitting the earth or some kind of a coronal mass ejection. And it was so big that in 1989, it knocked out most of Quebec's uh, power grid. And, and I believe also a big chunk of uh, Minnesota, uh, their power grid. Um, now, um, here's another diagram that we talked about. And this is the analogy between uh, capacitant, uh, bet in, between an LC circuit with an inductance uh, and a capacitance. Uh, and the analogy is to a spring system. And we found that the, uh, the same mathematical conditions uh, in, lead to the uh, oscillation of the electric and magnetic fields in the LC system as exists in the simpler system of the spring. You know, the spring system, F equals minus Kx, potential energy 1 half Kx squared, and similar conditions exist over in the LC circuit, uh, except for the fact that both the magnetic field and the electric field oscillate together. They counter oscillate. So when the electric field is intense, the magnetic field is zip zap and vice versa. And so that led us to talk about electromagnetic radiation. And here's a very simple LC circuit uh, connected to an antenna that drives electrons up and down the antenna. And because of that, um, it generates an electromagnetic field. And it's a, it's a wave, uh, an electromagnetic uh, traveling wave. And the, the wave equation C equals lambda F, C being the speed of light, lambda being the wavelength of the wave, and F being its frequency. Uh, that holds for all electromagnetic radiation. Here's the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation that we talked about briefly. Uh, and, and, you know, the Roy G. Bibb, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, visible part of the spectrum is in between infrared and ultraviolet. And then further out are radio waves and gamma rays. Gamma rays are high frequency and high energy. Those are the damaging rays. X-rays too. Um, and then, and ultraviolet is higher energy than visible and ultraviolet is damaging to your skin, for instance. You can get sunburn and skin cancer and that kind of stuff. Infrared is lower energy. It's lower frequency, lower energy, and radio waves are very, very low. And there's various portions of the spectrum, you know, like microwaves, um, 
radar is not in here, but uh, radar would be at about the boundary between infra infrared and, and radio. And you can see the, the these are logarithmic scales as well. Um, 10 to the minus 16, 10 to the minus 12, and so forth on the, on the wavelength scale. Frequency is up in the you know, 10 to the 4 hertz all the way up to 10 to the 24 hertz. And then we turn to talk about optics. And very most basic thing was the law of reflection. And what we did with this is uh, we applied the law of reflection to flat mirrors and also to curved mirrors, uh, spherical, parabolic, and hyperbolic. And the, the one that we worked out in detail was, was this one, the spherical mirror. And up there at the point A where the red ray reflects, um, I, I just put in a little blue flat line to indicate that we think of that point as being a simple flat mirror, just for that little increment, that little part of the of the uh, of the sphere. And as we look at other rays, we 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 construct other little flat blue lines to represent the uh, flat mirror that we envision as the surface or a part, a segment of the surface of a curved sphere, of a curved mirror. And when we use that flat surface up there, you know, angle of reflection, here's angle of uh, reflection, or the angle of incidence, and here's angle of reflection. Those are equal. And if you work out the, the geometry of that, uh, you find that uh, the, um, that the incoming parallel rays in this case, the red ray coming in parallel, reflects through a point halfway between the mirror and the, ray, the center of the sphere. Uh, and that point F is called the focal point. Another thing that we started working with was um, uh, beats. Uh, and this is basically our discussion of the Doppler shift in electromagnetic radiation and how I think we talked about how a police officer and his, his speed gun, his radar gun, would use beats like this to, you know, two sources of waves that when you add them together back at the, at the, in the receiver, um, you, you can analyze it. You can analyze the beat frequency to get the speed of the car. And we worked out a couple of examples of that. Another thing that we studied was refraction, Snell's law, N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2, all kinds of different applications of that. Um, and it's important to remember that N encodes the speed of light. Uh, and we didn't work on lenses, but we did work out, we, we did work out this, you know, basic case here of, you know, water, you know, the incident ray into water and the incident ray out of water into the air. Uh, and we also did a couple other ones, including rainbows. And the, but the, fir the first one we did was this guy right here, all right, the guy with the split off head. And what we did just a few days ago, a couple, I think, a week and a half ago, uh, we just worked it out. Um, that if the if the uh, if the direct line to the guy's head above water is at about 45 degrees, like in this diagram, then the the underwater light rays that get to your eye uh, from below the water line have to come through a different route. They can't go directly. They've got to dip down a little bit more steeply theta i, that's the, the angle of incidence, and then they refract away from the normal line. That's the vertical black line there um, into your eye. So there's some point there where they, the, the rays that get to your eye are refracted, and that's what that arrow is uh, meant to symbolize.
Um, and so that's why that guy looks, you know, like we look one direction to see his coconut and we look up the, you know, slightly to the right uh, to see everything from his neck down, which is kind of why this, this picture is kind of, kind of cool. All right. So, and we, you know, you, you basically have this situation where, you know, you analyze the light using Snell's law and the, the image does make sense. Another thing that we talked about was uh, wave optics, physical optics, uh, in which diffraction occurs. And this is an image of uh, green laser light diffracting through a circular aperture. Okay. And you get, as we mentioned in class on Monday, you get construct, alternating patterns of constructive interference where it's bright green and destructive interference where it's black. And this is what it looks like if it comes through um, a circular aperture. Now, one of the other cool things is if you, if you send plane waves into a circular object, you know, classically speaking, um, if you shine some light on a baseball, there's going to be a shadow directly behind the baseball. All right. There's not going to be any light back there. All right. It's total blackness. And if you go out in space on the far side of the moon, you know, you're in the shadow. If, if you're in the, sh if you're, um, you know, you know, circling the moon and you go through the dark side of the moon, man, it is, the sky back there is black, B-L-A-C-K, very deep shadow, All right? And, uh, but if you're on, you know, of course, on the, the light side of the, of the moon uh, facing the sun, you get plenty of sunlight. So the idea was here was, okay, why, you know, if, if waves are really, if light is really a wave, how do you even get a shadow? Because really, if, if you have, um, you know, a very well sharp, op, sharply defined surface, like a ball bearing, you're going to get diffraction around the edges. Now, it's re a really tough problem calculus-wise. But these guys, Fresnel, Poisson, and Arago, figured it out, and they found that there is a dot, a bright dot back there. They call it Poisson's dot, and that was one of the, the you know, the, the the total proofs that yes, light is behaves as a wave as well as it behaving like a particle. I mean, Sir Isaac Newton figured out, you know, light behaves in a lot of ways like a particle. And many people believe that was the only thing it did until this, until uh, they found Poisson's dot. And in that time, they figured out that uh, it's, it's behaves in both ways. Like it behaves as a wave and a particle. Now, what we did um, Monday, just yesterday, we looked at the raindrop. And we, you know, and I calculated it all out and I designed it carefully. You can see all my, um, my surfaces are all those tangent lines. Okay, so those are my um, uh, tangent surfaces at each point of interaction. And the lines that kind of come out, I guess I missed one of them. Uh, there's a line at 45 degrees. That's my normal at the first interaction point. And the one that's down there at the third interaction point is almost um, straight down. It's a little, it's a few degrees uh, away from straight down, uh, which I calculated. And uh, so I calculated all these normals and, and the, the planes, and then I put in the, the rays and stuff. And you can see that it comes out at a slightly different angle. And the reason for refraction for rainbows, as we said, was that each color has a slightly different index of refraction. You know, it's not going to be exact. You know, in this one, we said, OK, let's say that N2 is 1.33 for red. But then you to, to see the, the rainbow effect, all you have to know is that the index of refraction is slightly different for all the other colors in the rainbow, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And so therefore, they come out at a slightly different angle. And so you'll see the light rays disperse. And that's a case of dispersion. Um, 
uh, one of the, the ways that light disperses, right? But not the only way. Another way is through diffraction, as we mentioned, and I mentioned already, that at certain angles away from the slit, the, the, whatever the aperture is, if it's a diffraction grating, if it's a circular aperture, if it's two slits like this, um, at certain angles, you get constructive interference in a bright spot. In other angles, you get uh, destructive interference in a dark spot. And that's what gave us those rings and brights, those dark rings and bright rings in the uh, a few images back. And it's also what gives us um, the fingerprints for every element in the universe, from hydrogen to helium and all the way up to the, the uh, heavier elements like uranium. They have distinctive spectral lines, uh, and we observe them by diffraction. And in this image, you can see a red line near Megan's right ear and a, and a, a faint uh, blue line uh, by her left eye. And, uh, and over to the right, you can see the actual hydrogen source. It's a tube filled with pure hydrogen and then zapped with high voltage top and bottom, and it causes it to glow. And those specific diffraction lines are the fingerprints of hydrogen. Similar colors, or no, I shouldn't say similar, a different set of colors for uh, helium, neon, oxygen, and a lot. And then you start getting, you know, with some of these other elements, you get ultraviolet lines. And I think, and hydrogen has some ultraviolet lines as well. And some infrared lines, you get infrared and you can get all different wavelengths depending on the atom and that's their fingerprints. Uh, so that was the last thing that we talked about for the semester. And I think to me, the most important, this is the most important picture of the semester because there's an incredible amount of physics in the diffraction. Uh, in, in observing and photographing a diffraction image like this. Because if you think about it, you have, to, you have to understand the electric field, you have to understand the magnetic field, you have to um, understand what waves do, you have to understand constructive and destructive interference, and it, in particular for hydrogen, you have to understand the, you know, the, the theory of the nucleus, which you know, we didn't go into, but that is why the, the lines are specific and not a rainbow. But there's an, an enormous amount of physics in this one uh, image, this one demonstration. And I like to do the diffraction in a normal semester when we're in a lecture hall. I like to do this on the first day to motivate the entire semester. And a few other demonstrations, uh, like the moving uh, the jumping wires is a good demonstration of electromagnetism and force and all kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, we talked about that, but we didn't really, we couldn't really d demonstrate it over the over the internet. But um, there's innumerable uh, YouTubes about it that you can look at. But anyways, I like to do this at the beginning of the semester to motivate everything in the semester because I can always, every lecture that I'm taught that I talk about from day one till the end of the semester, I can always make a mention of this, you know, this phenomena, uh, diffraction. So, so that's it. Well, I'll see you guys in office hours later to this afternoon. It's almost one o'clock now. I'll put this on YouTube and you can have a look at it. And then uh, I'll see, you know, you'll, you'll take your exam tomorrow at one, All right? And I'm still working on it. I haven't finished writing it. Uh, but now you have uh, a nice little uh, kind of semester in review and a few extra thoughts, I guess, for me about each topic. And, uh, have a good exam tomorrow if I don't talk to you in office hours.